Okay, thank you. Now we, we are now live. Uh, so welcome back to Vermont House Judiciary Committee and we are continuing our discussion on S30 and attorney Eric Fitzpatrick is going to uh, talk about language that uh, regarding uh, shooting competitions that uh, passed the um, House and Senate a few years back and was um, part of a bill that was vetoed. And uh, my understanding is that it is, um, this language is of interest to, uh, uh, to folks. So thank you, Eric. Yeah, sure. Uh, good morning again, everybody. It's Eric Fitzpatrick with uh, Legislative Council again here to walk the committee through uh, the language that Representative Grad just mentioned. It's on the website, I just pulled it up. And uh, this language as well, I think was actually in S-169 that was, was vetoed by the governor. I mentioned uh, uh, some of the other language you looked at, the ERPO language was also in S-169 and, and this also was in that bill. And this deals with um, the prohibition in existing law on large capacity ammunition uh, feeding devices, these high, high capacity magazines. Uh, this exists in current law, it was also passed in 2018 it was part of that same bill that the background check provision was in, which was Act 94. I think I, I misspoke earlier when I said that the ERPO provision, the Extreme Risk Protection Order, was in that was in that act. It was not. It was passed in the same year, 2018, but that was in a separate act, Act 97. Uh, but Act 94 included both the the background check provision and this uh, prohibition on large capacity ammunition feeding devices. <clears throat> now in the Excuse me. In the uh, in the language of Act 94, as it was passed uh, in 2018, uh, this prohibition on the on the on the high capacity magazines uh, did have several exemptions. And one of the exemptions uh, that was in existing statute, you can see, um, <clears throat> is in the non underlined language in subsection D, right in the middle of the page there, D1F. And what this refers to is is um, uh, the use of the high capacity magazines uh, for in devices that are transported transported into Vermont by a resident of another state for a shooting competition. So there was an exemption uh, when the when the ban was passed for uh, high uh, high capacity magazines that were transported by by a resident of another state for the exclusive purpose of an established shooting co competition. If the device was lawfully possessed under the laws of that state where it came from. However, this exemption had a sunset so that it only lasted until July 1st, 2019. So at that time, the exemption sun sunset and it no longer existed. So the proposal here is to essentially uh, reinstate the exemption. And uh, so it uh, would be current law. And uh, it makes three minor changes, or I shouldn't say minor, the three changes to to the exemption as it, as it existed for a short time before it sunset. Now, first you see that the language has changed slightly uh, from established shooting competition to organized shooting competition. I think that was proposed by, by um, uh, the sportsman groups who, who were involved in these competitions because that language more accurately uh, describes the events. Uh, second, the, ex the exemption is expanded to include Vermonters as well. So, um, uh, it wouldn't just be uh, uh, an out of state person. You'll see in sub Roman numeral two, the exemption would apply if device was possessed and used at an organized shooting competition. So again, that's not limited to an out of state resident. That's anybody who possesses and uses it at one of these uh, organized shooting competitions, uh, provided that the, the device was lawfully possessed on or before Octo October 1st, 2018. And the reason that's in there is because um, uh, Act 94 included a grandfathering provision so that uh, the, the prohibition on possession of, of these high capacity magazines uh, didn't apply if, if uh, the magazine was sold uh, by a dealer before October 1st, 2018. So it sort of gave them some time. I think the idea, if I remember correctly, was the time to, to get rid of their existing inventory without violating the law. So that uh, as long as you met that grandfather date, 
then you could still possess it lawfully. So the idea here is that, okay, you're going to continue the, the exemption for organized shooting competitions, but only if you had one of the uh, high capacity magazines that, that was subject to the grandfathering, that was grandfathered in um, uh, properly under the October, October 1st, 2018 date. Um, and I believe that's uh, yeah, it's pr pretty, pretty short. So uh, that's the, the proposal of the, of the amendment here. Thank you, uh, Will. Sure. Thank you. So uh, I have a question about the, the very bottom language arc. So um, if the device was lawfully possessed on or before October 1st, 2018, you know, straight, mostly straightforward. Um, my question is, does it have to have been lawfully possessed by the person using it um, since October 1? I'm thinking, you know, Fred and George are brothers. They both want to compete in one of these competitions. George has two of these um, you know, high capacity magazines that he purchased legally before the ban. And he wants to sell or give one to his brother so they can both compete. Um, would, you know, would they be able to do that? Would someone be able to acquire a high capacity, you know, one of these magazines that was legally owned by someone else to use in these competitions? Or if you did not have one before the ban went into effect, are you just out of luck um, as far as competing in these competitions would go? Uh, that's an interesting question. Frankly, I had not thought about it. Um, so the, the language, the existing prohibition says, uh, basically applies to any person. So any person can't possess one of these devices, that's subsection A above, uh, but doesn't apply if the device was possessed at an or organized shooting competition, if the device was lawfully possessed. Um, so it, it, I think it could conceivably apply to another person uh, other than uh, the person who lawfully possessed it before October 1st, 2018. Um, that's potentially correct. When I think about it a bit more, but I think I think that the reading would permit, you know, say person A uh, lawfully possessed it on October 1st, 2018, wants to let person B use it at the organized shooting competition. I think that probably would be would be exempted. All right. Thank you. And yeah, and uh, just you know, I'm just speaking as one member of this committee. If you did look at it and decide that it needed. Uh, clarifying language. If we were going to move forward with this as an amendment, you know, I would certainly prefer clarifying language that made it clear that um, someone was able to use one that was lawfully possessed, you know, by someone else, by a brother or friend, what what have you. Because uh, otherwise, it just seems unfair to me to determine who can fairly compete in these competitions based on whether or not they own this piece of hardware at a certain date. Thank you. Thank you. And we will be um, taking testimony on this and, and getting a better understanding of, of, um, uh, of the origins and the, the intent of, of the language moving forward. Yeah, if I remember right, when we did this, that uh, lawful firearms and I guess you could say uh, and accessories uh, can't, could be uh, lent or borrowed. Um, in the uh, but we obviously covered the the sales uh, as being something different. Okay, thank you. Yeah, we will certainly look into all of that. Any other uh, questions from committee members on this section? Eric, thank you. Thank you very much. It's very helpful. I know we, you're right it did take <laughs> longer. But, uh, Shall I stop screen, screen right. sharing for now? Um, yes, thank you. Thank you very much. It's very, very helpful. Sure. Okay. Good. Um, so I am going to go um, out of order because I do see that um, Dr. Ryan Sexton is here. And I know, um, Dr. Sexton, I know that you had a. Um, Time, um, time constraints. So if you are um, prepared to testify by now, um, that would be great. So we could let you get on with your on with your day. Does that work for you? I am, thank you very much. Yeah, sure.
Yeah. Welcome. Um, thank you. Yes, good morning. Um, my name is Dr. Ryan Sexton. I'm the medical director of the emergency department at Northeastern Vermont Regional Hospital in St. Johnsbury. Um, I'm also chair of the Vermont uh, Emergency Department Medical Directors Committee. Um, I'm the immediate past president of the Vermont chapter of the American College of Emergency Physicians, and I'm the president-elect of the Vermont Medical Society. Um, just as an introduction, th thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Um, I'm here speaking on behalf of the Vermont Medical Society and in full support of S30 uh, to prohibit firearms in hospitals and to allow for healthcare providers to notify law enforcement when a patient possess, uh, poses a serious and imminent threat uh, to the, self, uh, the health and safety of a person or the public. I work with a caring team of um, nurses and physicians um, in a challenging and unpredictable environment. Emergency departments and other areas of the hospital uh, that provide critical care can be quite chaotic. Um, situations can be highly volatile um, and emotionally charged at times. And unfortunately, it's not uncommon that our frontline staff uh, face verbal threats and physical assaults from patients and visitors. Um, so common, in fact, uh, that OSHA accepts that workplace violence is a recognized hazard in the healthcare industry. A recognized hazard. According to the um, Emergency Nurses Association, the ENA, OSHA data reveals that in recent years, Workers in the healthcare sector make up about 50%, half of all victims of workplace assault. In 2016, a study was conducted that showed 100% of emergency department nurses experience violence from patients. A 2018 uh, ASEP, that's the American College of Emergency Physicians survey of more than 3,500 emergency physicians showed that nearly half had been physically assaulted at work with the majority of those assaults occurring within the previous year. 80% of emergency physicians uh, responding to that survey noted that a patient has threatened to return and harm them or their emergency department staff at a later date. I'd like to share a personal story. Um, about a year ago, uh, I took care of a young man um, with a new onset acute and severe psychosis. Working with our mental health crisis team, it was determined that he was a severe risk to himself and could not safely be discharged home from the emergency department and that he would require inpatient psychiatric treatment. While being held in our emergency department, um, uh, uh, I, I, I met with the young man's parents uh, to explain the treatment plan to them. And I sat with them in a private small consult room and. You know, gently explain the situation to them. Um, I informed them that their son had a new onset severe psychiatric illness and that he would need to be hospitalized for treatment um, and for uh, to ensure his safety. The patient's father um, had difficulty accepting his son's condition um, and specifically the need for inpatient psychiatric treatment. He disagreed with that. He turned his frustration. Um, on me and uh, stated the following. He said, if you put my son in the hospital, I will come after you and your children. And it was clear that he meant this. It's not uncommon for patients' family members to misinterpret our intent in providing emergent care to their loved ones and respond aggressively. Fortunately, uh, this incident occurred immediately adjacent to the hospital security office and near a hospital exit. And I was able to step out and security intervened. The patient's father was escorted off campus by security. Had this man been armed that day, I do believe this incident could have ended differently. I'm concerned with the growing uh, mistrust of healthcare uh, that's been observed during this pandemic. The ongoing propagation of misinformation has left many questioning healthcare expert opinion. The public in general is frustrated with the pandemic response and the need for frequently shifting guidance and on and off restrictions. As recently as two days ago, I had a patient family member screaming at our ED nurses and physician 
in our waiting room, verbally threatening them because of our visitation policy, a policy that we have in place to protect patients and staff. So I have concerns that the risk our healthcare workers face pre-pandemic is even greater now. I think it's important to acknowledge that our hospitals, much like our schools, house a vulnerable population. Many of our patients are bed bound. They don't have the ability to self extricate from a dangerous situation. And our critical patients at times require minute to minute care. Our staff, our nurses and doctors will not simply evacuate to safety and leave their patients untreated and in harm's way. Unlike other environments, we do not have the liberty to remove ourselves or our patients from escalating in dangerous situations. I would also like to highlight the extreme staffing shortage that we are experiencing in healthcare. We are stretched so thin that we have nurses rotating between units to fill holes in the schedule in areas they've never worked. We are having to modify nurse to patient ratios to prevent ambulance diversion. We have federal teams right now supplementing staffing in our hospitals. There are no staff to engage patients and visitors who ignore hospital signage and bring their firearm into the hospital. Some of our critical access hospitals don't even have security personnel available. Hospital staff should not be burdened with ensuring hospitals are safe and that they're a firearm free zone. It seems like every couple months I read of a deadly shooting in a hospital in another state. We've been fortunate in Vermont to not have experienced an in-hospital shooting recently, but we remain at risk, arguably, arguably higher now than ever before. Vermont can do more to mitigate this risk. Patients and their visitors should know that hospitals are firearm-free zones before they ever arrive at the door. A parent being given unexpected devastating news about a child will have strong feelings and may act out with aggression. I'd like to know that they don't have a loaded firearm on their person when I give them this news. I would also like to express my support uh, for the section of this bill that specifically allows for healthcare providers to notify law enforcement when a patient poses a serious and imminent threat to the health and safety of a person in the public. Physicians strive to maintain patient privacy. We're required to do so. Um, and we're often conflicted when um, we have legit legitimate concerns that a patient poses extreme risk to another person. It's not uncommon for patients to state um, homicidal intent toward individuals outside of the hospital, for example, uh, toward their domestic partners, and that comes out as we take a history. Authorizing healthcare providers to disclose this information to law enforcement will help resolve this conflict and allow for timely law enforcement engagement and improve public safety. S30 will protect patients and their loved ones it will protect frontline nurses and physicians. It will protect the public. And I urge you to vote in favor of S30 and in support of improving safety in our hospitals across the state. I appreciate you hearing my testimony today and I am available for questions. Great. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, Ken. Uh, <clears throat> good morning, doctor, thank you. Good morning. Um, when you're dealing with a situation um, where there's mental health involved. Um, do you have somebody right close by to deal with that situation if it gets out of control? And by somebody, who do you mean? Security. Um, in, in, in my hospital, we, we now have uh, security personnel who are um, on site. Uh, they may or may not be in the emergency department. We see a lot of mental uh, health disease in our emergency department. And um, we have one security staff on at all times in the hospital who will be, you know, patrolling the grounds and potentially um, responding to other situations. Um, when we have something, uh, situation escalating, uh, we will call them for assistance and, and they do respond as quick as they can. This is a new um, uh, support for our hospital. There was a period of time recently when we had no support, no uh, security in house. And I do know of other critical access hospitals uh, that lack sec uh, security, um, both I think because of pandemic, but also uh, pre-pandemic just don't have the ability to have uh, the resources to have in-house security available. So, do you, so I, I guess uh, two things. 
do you have actual law enforcement uh, at your facility at all times? No. Okay, so going back to your security, um, what do they have uh, for security measures that they can use? Are they, are they carrying a, a uh, firearm or are they carrying um, uh, sun guns? Are, do they have anything? No. I don't believe they carry any firearm, uh, nor do they uh, carry any um, taser or weapon. Okay. Um, that's it for now. Thank you. Thank you. Felicia. Yes, thank you. Um, I just had a quick question, and actually it's regarding um, an interaction I had within my work outside of the legislature. Um, I work both as a medical assistant at UVM Medical Center as and as an EMT. So uh, I do have some interaction in some interesting places within Vermont's uh, hospitals. And without going into the details as to violate HIPAA, but I brought a patient in uh, from a situation where she notified me as we brought her into the emergency department that in her purse, she had her personal handgun that was there for her protection due to the situation that we brought her from. Now she notified me because she was just in complete shock. She already thought this was a crime and was terrified that by leaving that there, by grabbing her purse on the way out, she had committed a crime, which she did not intend to commit. Now we notified um, hospital staff, security came, put it into their safe that they have for this situation. My concern is that unintentionally, we are bringing people in from situations where it is not a cognitive intent to bring a weapon into the hospital. But there's not really um, a lot of decision making that happens on that very emergent side of emergency medicine. It's just grabbing their belongings, trying to treat the situation at hand and bring them to the closest, most appropriate medical facility. And with your experience in uh, medical direction, I'm sure that this is something familiar to you. In that instance, what are you recommending that we do? And my understanding is that this bill makes a criminal out of her without any intent. So I, I, I have some concern that we are not, we are not taking into account every avenue here. And I don't think it should be on the individuals bringing that patient in to be doing screening. There are are more pressing matters in, in those situations that they should have their hands on. Um, and not, at not all times is the patient in the capacity that they can make a decision or make a conscious choice. It's just grabbing belongings and we don't know what's in them. So not to ever diminish the, the necessary safety of healthcare providers, um, or, or the risks that the situations that they're in puts them in. Is there something within that kind of situation that you would <clears throat> recommend, <clears throat> recommend on either end? Because that's a situation that I've had happen, my colleagues have had happen, and it is not with a malicious intent. Um, but this bill does not make an exception for that. And, and that is a serious concern of mine. Sure. So I, I, it sounds like in your example, um, there was both lack of intent and probably lack of capacity there. And I, you know, um, I, I, I don't know how that would proceed within, you know, the, the legal uh, framework, but I imagine it'd be hard to, to prove guilt in that situation. But wouldn't it be great if you as an EMT responding to a situation and picking up a patient, if the patient, family members present, 
that everyone knew that firearms were not permitted in the ambulance, at, in hospitals, that, that we could do something to guarantee some safety there for, our, for, for you and for our staff. Um, you know, I think this is a tool uh, that allows for um, hopefully hospital staff to not have to confront patients um, with, with these situations. I, I, I do feel that, it, that, that there will be less, less, less of a likelihood of a firearm showing up in an emergency department. I think that you're right that there will be rare accidental uh, occasions. Uh, I hope that they would be few and far between. And, um, you know, I, I, I think that signage at the hospital and public messaging around this will certainly be necessary. Thank you. I, I appreciate your response. Um, unfortunately, EMTs don't have the, the same opportunity to have that signage is that we do respond to people's homes and we do really have um, a much, much more limited opportunity um, beyond immediate patient care in many situations to, to create that conversation or investigatory moment. Um, so while I, I do appreciate your comments, I just, there, there is a delineation and there is a gray area here and that is a serious concern for me. Yeah, thank you. And Bob, I'll get to you in a second. Um, Felicia, thank you for that, um, for that comment. And when we have um, time with Eric, um, we can look at, um, knowingly and what does what does knowingly mean in S30 as passed by the Senate um, and and um, and your situation and some other hypotheticals and, and flesh that out so so thank you for for bringing that to um, to our attention uh, go ahead Bob thank you good morning Dr. Sexton thanks for being here I appreciate your testimony I noticed when you were uh, responding to representative Goslin's uh, uh, questions about your security service within your hospitals. Now, I have no idea how many hospitals we have in the state of Vermont, nor do I know who the hospitals uh, contract with for security services. My question to you is, uh, is this a choice of the medical association or the individual hospitals or to just not arm security services that are available to work within the hospitals? And, and the reason I ask that is it's kind of a somewhat placing the individuals in a precarious position where they may or may not be expected to respond to an armed incident within a hospital setting, and yet they're not armed themselves. Um, I, I can't speak to the uh, decision. I, I don't know of any, you know, th th this bill would allow for law enforcement to uh, certainly respond to situations and be present with a firearm. Um, uh, a hospital uh, security staff that is not uh, law enforcement, not trained to the level of law enforcement. Um, you know, I, I, I don't know that they should have a weapon on their person, but um, I, I, again, I can't, I, uh, I, I can't speak to the decision um, on, on how hospitals determine security. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Uh, Ken. Uh, good morning again, doctor. Do you find that most of these uh, situations that you're encountering are more mental health related? Um, well, in the example I gave, which is one of the more extreme that I've had in terms of, you know, what, what I perceive to be a real threat to myself and my family. Um, that was mental health related uh, because, you know, it was a mental health patient. But in fact, the, the family did not, the, the father in that circumstance did not have any uh, mental illness that I'm aware of. Um, there certainly are um, uh, a lot of violence directed toward our frontline staff from uh, patients with acute psychiatric illness. Um, that That's real. Um, I think that there are also... Uh, situations where family, as I mentioned, uh, visitors uh, and patients themselves become quite upset um, with 
uh, hearing of uh, you know a diagnosis or um, you know seeing a family member uh, go through extreme um, uh, acute illness and and reacting. Um, you know, I, I can't speak if there's underlying mental health for those individuals or not. Um, uh, so, so yes and, and no, I, I, I do think that with our acute mental health patients that come in, there is a, a degree of violence that we see when people are acutely psychotic. So um, the other question I have, I'm, I'm just, I'm not sure I heard you properly. Um, did you say that you don't like the idea of security being armed? I, I, without um, proper training, I no, I don't think a hospital security uh, personnel should be armed with a firearm. Well, I think we all can agree with that. Um, the first thing that comes to my mind with, with uh, dealing uh, with uh, society nowadays um, that are going through a very trying time um, is first of all, I think people think they need or want personal protection uh, more than ever for themselves. Um, I know that it's, it's on my mind and I don't carry at the moment. Um, but I would think, just me, in your situation, you would want someone close by that if somebody um, that was unstable mental, mentally or whatever set it on a rampage, hopefully somebody could, could help uh, the situation to, to keep it at a bare minimum because I don't think it's, um, or I certainly hope it's not, um, a, a stable person that's probably going to do something like this. This is, uh, I'm going to keep going back to the mental health situation uh, that we have uh, that is very concerning. And also uh, the lack of law enforcement uh, that we have along with the, with the medical. I mean, we are, we are uh, really struggling in Vermont um, to have the, uh, uh, right amount of, of workers uh, uh, that we need. And I also appreciate very much um, you being here and doing what you're doing and uh, for the health of the state, thank you. Yeah, thank you. If I could just respond briefly. Um, you know, I, I in the example that I provided, um, the father uh, of the patient who presented with, with, you know, was was not intending that day to wake up and come in and, you know, uh, hear that news. Uh, he was not intending to threaten a physician. Um, I, I think that, um, you know, that's a case and, and this happens. It's not uncommon that we see patients who are in a right state of mind when they enter the emergency department um, react uh, violently uh, and aggressively. And so what, what I hope is that the, the likelihood of uh, them using a firearm uh, would, would, would decrease uh, in those situations, if they knew ahead of time that the firearm stays in the car. Um, well, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, uh, and and you know, to the point of responding to mental health uh, for for security to 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 be there to assist the clinical team. Um, you know, I, I think we work very hard to de-escalate um, uh, situations. Uh, mental patients suffering from mental health disease. Um, and you know, I, I don't think um, a firearm in the emergency department um, uh, for, for most situations is warranted. Uh, you know, I, I do think you know, when we need law enforcement, I would love law enforcement to be able to respond as quickly as possible. And I would agree that at times, I feel like our, our law enforcement is stretched thin as well. So I, I guess just going back to make sure that uh, my point was getting across is I would think automatically um, when you're dealing with a stressful situation that you're going to be dealing with parents 
um, and you're about to tell them that there's a mental health situation with their child, that you would have backup close by because you don't know how that situation is going to work out. Now, I'm, I'm not a medical uh, professional or anything like that, but my common sense um, ap approach to that would be, I could be putting myself in a very volatile situation and I'm going to make sure that I've got uh, somebody uh, for backup to control a situation that could get out of hand very quickly uh, for for everybody's safety. Um, and that's something if the hospitals don't have instituted, I would think that would would be something that they would would be uh, certainly would be at the top of their list. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, not seeing any other hands. So, so thank you very much. Thank you for making yourself uh, available to our committee. Appreciate it. Absolutely. I appreciate being here. Thank you for the work that you do. Thank you. Okay. I would um, now like to turn to Devin Green, please. Good morning. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Devin Green um, from the Vermont Association of Hospitals and Health Systems. I just want to underline everything that Dr. Sexton testified to today, and I'm happy to answer more specific questions. But for the broad picture, Dr. Sexton is completely right. Um, federal data shows that out of all of the healthcare or out of all of the sectors of work in the United States, 73% of all non-fatal workplace injuries and illnesses due to violence happen with healthcare workers. So healthcare workers really are vulnerable to violence just by getting up and going to their job every day. At the same time, we're trying to create a safe space for patients too. So we wanna create a safe space for patients and healthcare workers, we often, um, we have suggested putting signs up that say that this is a safe space and we don't think having a gun in the hospital creates that safe environment that we need for our vulnerable patients and our vulnerable healthcare workers. Since the pandemic, we've only seen tensions rise. Healthcare workers are burned out, they're stressed, they're dealing with more conflict than ever, and they have a skeleton staff um, to just provide care to people. Um, representative, your suggestion about having someone nearby when um, providing bad news is a good one, but the fact is we've heard from our emergency departments that they're having trouble bringing food to people or bringing people to the bathroom because they are so stressed in right now and they are so full of patients and they are constantly providing bad news. So while that's a great practice, we are severely understaffed at this point. Um, this sort of confrontation doesn't happen often, but it has happened in Vermont. We did hear of a um, emergency department medical director who a parent uh, was upset. A nurse went over and asked the parent to put away his gun and put it back into his car. He started debating um, about whether or not this was an infringement on his second amendment rights. The nurse uh, was, trying to discuss it with him. Um, he was very upset. The conflict didn't end until the medical director came over and let the father know that they weren't able to care for his child because they were in discussion with him about his weapon. And so it was only at that point that he finally took it back to his car and locked it up there. So this is a situation that happens in Vermont. Um, and when it does, it has the ability to just impact other people in hospitals. That means other people aren't getting care. And if you have an actor, an active shooter at a hospital, that means that hospital gets shut down. Um, so not only are the people in the hospital in danger, but the people outside of the hospital are also in danger because they will have to go on diversion and go to a hospital that's farther away. Right now, our emergency departments are having trouble placing the patients that they have in their care already. They're calling 20 to 40 hospitals to put patients where they need to be. Um, they're sending people as far away as Connecticut because we have such a capacity issue right now. 
if one of our hospitals goes down, um, that's going to potentially impact other people outside of the hospital and could be fatal. Um, we need hospitals to be a safe place for patients and healthcare workers, and we can't waste a minute by not providing care. Please send a clear message that firearms in hospitals will not be tolerated. And to get to some of the questions that were asked before, a lot of the security in hospitals are, they do not, they tend to not carry weapons because there are federal regulations um, against using weapons on patients. So we had an incident, there have been incidents in hospitals where security has pulled a weapon and that hospital has been in danger of losing all of its federal funding. So all of its Medicare money, all of its Medicaid money, it would have had to close down. Um, so we do have security staff at most of our hospitals, not all of our hospitals. They're trained to de-escalate, they're trained to step in and help, um, but they are not necessarily able to carry a weapon. And that is to ensure that we do not violate federal regulations. The other piece I want to touch on, touch on is that I don't see this necessarily as a mental health issue. I see this as a high stakes sort of emotional issue. I think a lot of times the mental health piece gets wrapped in there when in reality, a lot of people suffering in mental health crisis are more vulnerable to violence than actually committing violence. Um, they come in and there are assaults and that is usually happening because you know they need to be restrained or they're in psychosis. Um, but not necessarily because they have a weapon. I think this is an everything issue. I think someone, as Dr. Sexton said, can wake up one morning not expecting to confront someone, not expecting to threaten someone, but they hear about what's happened to a loved one and things can get heated very easily. There's also not only in the emergency department, but in places like, um, you know, uh, like in areas where babies are delivered, there can be heated arguments. Um, due to domestic issues. And so, again, these are very vulnerable patients. These are really burnt out, stressed out healthcare workers who are also vulnerable, who will stay with their patients um, and protect them. And so the best thing to do is to create a situation where um, individuals know ahead of time guns in uh, hospitals will not be tolerated. Thank you. Thank you, and I appreciate the clarification and expansion on, on some of the questions that we heard. Uh, committee members, I'm not seeing any hands, but any any questions? Any witness? I, I, sure. I, I just, um, um, I'm trying to um, understand or trying to figure out if somebody is going to any building with the intent to do something, even if they don't have a firearm, signs aren't going to stop them, a law is not going to stop them. Nothing is nothing is going to stop them unless they have an accident or something like that on the way, um, and that's where one of the things I'm really really struggling with this with this whole situation. There's there's a, a large part of me that says <clears throat> we're neighbor uh, helping neighbor keeping each other safe, and and I've been in this state. Um, the majority of my life, I actually come, was born in St. Johnsbury, that um, I think we could be opening up a, a situation where uh, we're actually uh, creating more of a danger for, for people. And this really is weighing heavily on me. And I appreciate everybody's uh, testimony on this, but this is... Um, uh, I, I think Vermont is is um, one of the safest states in the nation uh, per capita, and I want to make sure we keep it that way. And uh, but I do appreciate hearing from everybody, and and uh, thank you. 
And representative, I think we're just looking to decrease the opportunity, right? You may go into a hospital not thinking you're going to confront anyone, but you get very upsetting news and you see a firearm in someone's purse and you do something terrible. Let's take away that opportunity so it's not available in these volatile situations. I'm, I, I don't want to get in a situation with you, but I mean, if I, I guess if somebody was to go and fly off the handle and there was a knife right there or something that they could use as a weapon, they're going to do that too. If somebody's going to flip out, whatever they can have um, is going to be right there for them to go and explode. And, um, and that is one part of the uh, society um, that we're all facing. Um, more than ever right now, or certainly all the years that I've I've been on the face of this earth. Thank you. And I do understand that, but the active shooter, if someone takes that gun, then that hospital shut down. Um, and that means every other patient who would be going to that hospital needs to go to a different hospital and may lose care that way too. So that's, that's where um, I do see the necessity to have in hospital. I hear your concerns but it does feel like hospitals um, really need this sort of protection. So, so I'm not, I'm not trying to argue with you, but you're saying we'll have to close down that uh, hospital and move everybody out. We're, we're not, you're locking down that hospital to get the situation under control. Nobody is going out of that hospital at that time. No, no one's going to that hospital, but anyone on the way to the hospital, anyone who has an emergency, who has a heart attack, who has a car accident, can't go to that hospital. They will have to go to a hospital that's farther away. Thank you. Tom. Yeah, I, I, I don't know who this question is for, but are, are, uh, I guess the only way I can word it, do hospitals allow firearms now or is there, uh, do they have any uh, uh, rules or in place? Um, is there any signage or anything like that at Vermont hospitals? Yeah, I would say the majority of hospitals have signage and don't allow firearms. Um, but again, what we're saying here is, and, and I've heard the idea of, you know, you have the sign in the hospital, and then um, if someone brings a gun, the healthcare worker can go over them and at, over to them and ask them to leave. And then if they refuse to leave, then you call the police officer. And what I'm saying is, what I'm saying here is that a really helpful tool for hospitals would be to not have that extra confrontation be necessary in this sort of situation, especially given the attitude towards healthcare workers now where there's another whole level of suspicion that's happening and we're seeing more and more confrontations. Right, right. Um, I guess this kind of along the same lines is, is what Ken was talking about, but uh, I, I think this is gonna give a false sense of security um, I know you gave an example of somebody, uh, you know, had a, uh, some kind of a breakdown in the hospital and somebody else had a gun and took it, you know, and, and used it that way. But I would be more concerned with somebody coming from offsite, uh, you know, carrying a gun themselves. And uh, um, we already have laws around violence and shooting people. And, <clears throat> and we're, Certainly, when somebody is in a mental state, um, just because there's a sign that's going to be posted that they shall not knowingly possess, and you know they could be in prison for a year or a thousand dollars, that uh, you know a thousand dollar fine, that isn't going to stop. That isn't going to stop them. Uh, you know, maybe it, you know, the, like the scenario you brought up, if somebody had a gun and somebody took it, type thing, that's. To me, that's going to be a, a, a real outlier potentially compared to somebody coming from off site. And, uh, and I just, we, ha we have laws to cover it already. Um, you know, and, and if somebody, we, I mean, even with somebody 
has a firearm in a hospital now, if, if there's signage there and they're asked to leave, there's laws that cover that. There's trespassing laws that, that could cover that. Um, and, and I just, uh, I just don't see where it's going to do any good. It's not going to, it's not going to stop anybody. Uh, it, we have laws now that don't stop people from shooting and killing people, you know, and, and uh, that are one hell of a lot more severe than what these are. And, um, and they aren't, they don't stop people. When somebody wants to inflict harm, they're going to inflict harm. Well, I just think, and sort of echoing what Dr. Sexton said, wouldn't it be nice if our stressed nurses could wake up in the morning and have the tool of, I don't have to go confront someone with a gun and ask them to leave today. I know that the police officers have my back and I can call them immediately instead of confronting them. Why can't you do that anyway? Because under the trespass laws, you have to ask the person to leave and they have to refuse to leave. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Very much appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you. Sure. Madam Chair, can oh, I just add one thing? Yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't see you. Yeah, go ahead. I, I didn't, I'm sorry. Um, I guess what I'm trying to say is, is I, I think I, I know what this proposal is trying to do. I am deeply concerned that this is going to go completely the other way and things are going to escalate into situations where they were never ever meant to go and especially when I'm hearing this spur of the moment stuff it's like somebody somebody would snap or something like that I I I am deeply concerned about this bill from all angles um and I, obviously I want to protect as many people as we possibly can but I really wonder if this won't work uh in the way you don't intend it thank you Thank you, and I, um, I and that um, I encourage you to bring that up when we have committee discussion. Um, is that something that you would um, that you would like Ms. Green to uh, respond to, or was it, uh, uh, if, if she'd like, sure. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to think. It's, it's, I, <laughs> um, I mean, I think. Uh, I think, again, we are trying really hard right now to create a safe environment. Um, and I think the best way to do that at this point is not only for, um, I think the best way to do that at this point is for everyone to go into a hospital with the expectation that there will not be lethal weapons involved. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. All right, we will now move on to uh, Seton McElroy, Moms Demand Action. Morning, uh, Seton McElroy. Doesn't look that way, but I promise it is. <laughs> sorry, sorry. No worries. Um, good morning, uh, everybody. Thank you so much for allowing me to speak to you today. Um, I know it's been a long morning, so I promise I'll try to keep it short. Um, my name is Seton McElroy. I live in Woodstock with my husband and two kids. I currently serve on the Village Board of Trustees and I'm a volunteer with the Vermont chapter of Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense in America. I'm speaking today in strong support of S30 sponsored by Senator Bruth, as well as Representative Knott's proposed amendments to the bill. Um, in our state with such a high gun ownership and a proud history of responsible hunting, we have made many strides to pass gun safety measures that um, embrace our responsible gun owners while ensuring safer communities. There is, however, still work to be done, and I thank the legislature for continuing to have these important discussions by bringing up this sensible bill today. First, I'd like to start with some background information on gun deaths in Vermont. Every year, an average of 64 Vermonters die by gun suicide, which is more than 50% of all suicides in the state. Our state also has the 15th highest rate of gun suicides and gun suicide attempts in the United States. This is why the Moms Demand chapter in Vermont has centered our advocacy and education programs on the intersection of suicide 
and gun violence. As a member of the Vermont Suicide Prevention Coalition, I have heard local experts talk about the connection between our suicide rates and the easy access to firearms in our state. It is imperative that we continue to provide tools to ensure guns don't fall into the hands of dangerous people and to help communities respond to those who may become a risk to themselves or to others. Thankfully, you all took action in 2018 by enacting the Extreme Risk Protection Order or an ERPO, which have been shown to prevent gun suicides. In fact, 61 ERPO petitions were filed in Vermont between the time the law took effect in 2018 through the end of 2020. Usage of the law has increased each year as people have become more aware of its availability. Representative Knott's amendments through its collection of data and reporting will provide an even deeper understanding of the use of Vermont's existing ERPO law. And I help, hope that it helps guide Vermont to eventually expand the ability of family and friends to petition the courts directly. Additionally, I support S30's prohibition on guns in hospitals. The presence of guns in hospitals makes us all less safe and adds an additional burden of concern to our healthcare workers who have faced so many challenges in the past two years of COVID-19. Finally, Representative Knott's proposed amendments to seek to close the background check, the hole in our background check, known as the Charleston loophole. This gap in our federal law allows a gun sale to go through after three business days, even if a background check has not been completed. This dangerous loophole allows people who are legally prohibited from having firearms to still get their hands on them, which poses a dangerous risk to our community and in particular to victims of domestic violence. 90% of federal background checks are completed within minutes, 90%. However, those that take longer than three business days are four times as likely to be denied. It's estimated that in 2020, almost 600,000 checks took longer than three business days and nearly 6,000 illegal purchasers obtained guns through this loophole, more than any other year on record. Background checks are a well-established, widely supported policy, and you all demonstrated your commitment to requiring them back in 2018 when you expanded our laws to require background checks in private sales. It's time that Vermont closes this loophole and ensures that all firearm sales have a completed background check. I urge you to support S30 as well as Representative Knott's proposed amendments. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, are you able to submit your um, your testimony um, for us to post on your website? Perhaps you already have. I haven't checked. Yes, but... uh, I sent it over to Amber last night. Okay, great. I'm sorry. I didn't, I... It's okay. I didn't... <laughs> okay. Um, so Tom, I, see, I think your hand is up from before, but I just want to make sure that you don't have a question. It's down. Okay. Uh, not seeing any other questions. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate great, your time. Great, thanks for your time. Yeah, thank you. Okay, we will we will now go to Allison. She, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing your name correctly, but uh, it is still morning. Good morning and welcome. Thank you. That's perfect. Um, good morning, Chair Grad, committee members. My name is Allison She. You pronounced it perfectly, um, and I serve as counsel for Every Town for Gun Safety, where I'm responsible for supporting state legislative efforts in Vermont. Every Town is the largest gun violence prevention organization in the country. We have nearly six million supporters, including moms, mayors, survivors, gun owners, and everyday Americans who are fighting for public safety measures that can help save lives. Thank you for hearing my testimony today, and thank you for your careful consideration of this important life-saving legislation. S30 and the proposed amendments demonstrate Vermont's commitment to gun safety and protecting Vermonters. I wanna focus my testimony today on one particular aspect of the amendments that will ensure the effectiveness of Vermont's existing background check system. As legislators in Vermont, you've continually demonstrated a commitment to ensuring that people who pose a risk to public safety due to a history of dangerous behavior are unable to purchase firearms. From requiring a background check on all firearm sales to passing an extreme risk law, as Mr. Fitzpatrick described earlier, you all have made significant strides to enact common sense gun laws to protect Vermonters and keep guns out of the hands of those who would use them to do harm to themselves or to others. 
However, there is more work to be done. Since 1993, a dangerous loophole in federal law has permitted firearm sales to proceed after three days, even if a background check has not yet been completed. This undermines the efficacy of the laws you have passed to help keep people safe. This loophole has proven to be deadly. It's known as the Charleston loophole because of the horrific shooting in 2015 in Charleston, South Carolina, when nine worshipers were shot in church by a man who was legally prohibited from owning a firearm, but was able to buy one because of this dangerous loophole. Recognizing the danger, 20 states and the District of Columbia have enacted laws to address it. We urge you to make Vermont the 21st state. I want to focus a bit on why some background checks take longer than three business than three business days. Nearly 90% of all background checks are completed within a matter of minutes, and 97% are completed within three days. And that's because most checks are quite simple. It's typically easy and fast to determine whether someone has a felony conviction in Vermont or another state or for a federal, federal crime that would make someone ineligible to carry a firearm. Often though, it's the checks that take longer that are the ones where it's more complicated to decipher a person's history. And we also know that those are the cases that are more likely to result in a denial. So take for example, misdemeanor domestic violence records. Searching misdemeanor records is often a bit more complicated. The person performing the background check needs to determine whether a conviction for misdemeanor assaults, for example, was domestic abuse or not. And this requires the person to dig deeply into court's records to identify the allegations and the person's relationship with the victim. And this kind of record searching just simply takes longer. From 2006 to 2015, nearly one out of every three gun sale denials to attempted buyers convicted of misdemeanor domestic abuse took longer than three business days. And importantly, checks that take longer than three days are four times more likely to result in a denial. In response to a FOIA request, the FBI reported that over 5,800 illegal purchasers acquired guns through the Charleston loophole that later had to be retrieved by law enforcement between January 1st and November 12th, 2020. That's more than in any other entire calendar year. And as Representative Knott shared earlier, 28 firearms had to be retrieved in Vermont from over the last couple of years. And because ATF agents are responsible for retrieving the, these guns, it's their lives that are placed in jeopardy by having to go into potentially dangerous situations to recover guns that never should have been sold to begin with. Allowing people to purchase a firearm before a background check is completed directly undermines existing Vermont laws and puts all Vermonters at risk. Extending the background check to 30 days will protect victims of abuse and would have prevented the mass shooting in Charleston. 30 days is the period of time that will make sure the background check system Vermont has is as effective as possible. Good gun safety policy is proactive. This bill could prevent Vermonters from experiencing a similar tragedy. This legislation will not unduly burden law-abiding gun purchasers. The vast majority of their background checks will be completed within a matter of minutes, and nearly all of them will be completed within three days. Very few people that are legally able to purchase a firearm will have a background check that takes longer than three days. And those that take longer than three days will still be able to purchase a firearm once the background check is completed. But this law will stop many prohibited people from obtaining firearms in the first place. It will help protect the victims of abuse and also protect law enforcement, their lives and their resources. And importantly, it will close a gap in the law that undermines your existing efforts to protect Vermonters by ensuring guns are sold only to people legally able to possess them. I wanna thank you for the opportunity to testify in support of this important legislation and I'm happy to take any questions that you may have. Thank you, thank you very much. Any questions? I'm not seeing any hands quite yet. I'll give people a minute or so.
No, thank you. Thank you very much. And I do see your testimony is on our website. So, and uh, as well as a, another document. Thank you very much. <laughs> Okay, we'll now turn to Ari Freilich, please. Hello and uh, good morning. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Um, my name is Ari Freilich. I'm an attorney and state policy director at Giffords, uh, the gun safety organization founded by former Congresswoman gun owner and gun violence survivor, Gabby Giffords. Um, on a personal note, as someone who's raised in uh, Chittenden County, whose family and community in the state of Vermont, I'm especially proud and thankful for your work in recent years to better protect uh, from honors, from, from preventable acts of violence and self-harm. Um, I'd like to focus my remarks today as well on the need to pass legislation before this committee to close what has been called the Charleston loophole. And I'll apologize in advance if I am repeating some statistics. Um, hopefully you agree a good statistic is worth hearing twice. But um, as you've heard in, in 2015, a, a gunman perpetrated a horrific shooting targeting black worshipers at an historic church in South Charleston, South Carolina with a gun he was legally prohibited from buying. The shooter actually underwent a background check to buy that weapon from a licensed gun store. He did not pass that background check, but he got the gun anyway. Under federal law, the dealer was legally authorized to complete the sale, deliver the gun solely because the FBI had not completed the check within three business days. The proposal to close this gap in Vermont raises a straightforward question for this committee. Simply put, should someone be able to purchase a firearm in the state of Vermont without actually passing a completed background check? Many people actually probably assume that Vermont lawmakers answered that question already when the state enacted its background checks law a few years ago. Vermont's law now generally requires people to conduct gun transactions through a licensed dealer who contacts the FBI to conduct the background check on the buyer. However, unless states act to close the federal loophole for their own residents, this loophole will cause thousands of people every year who are legally prohibited from accessing guns to walk into gun shops, submit to a background check, and return three days later armed with weapons designed to take and end human life without ever, without ever passing that background check. And I'll be the first to emphasize that this bill affects a relatively small portion of the tens of millions of people who undergo firearm background checks every year nationwide. The FBI's most recent operations report indicated that in 2019, the firearm background check system directly processed about 8.2 million firearm transactions and state agencies access the same system to conduct an additional 20 million more firearm transactions that year alone. We're talking about a lot of transactions, a lot of checks, a lot of guns. Um, the FBI's 8.2 million direct checks blocked just over 1% of those transactions by people who failed the background check. Spread over those millions of transactions, those numbers still add up. And the system prevented about 103,000 illegal gun transactions in 2019 alone. The system works, but the Charleston loophole in that system creates known and tolerable risks and failures for public safety by allowing thousands of people every year who are legally prohibited from accessing guns, majority of whom because of their serious criminal history, to nonetheless acquire deadly weapons because the background check was not completed in time. As other speakers noted, the background check system generally works quickly and efficiently. This isn't just a matter of bureaucratic waiting. Of the tens of millions of firearm background checks the FBI completes every year, the vast majority of checks are completed immediately. As you've heard, the FBI has issued immediate determinations on firearm background checks between 89 and 92% of the time every year for at least the last 15 years for which these records are available. The system, in fact, is generally required by federal rule to aim to provide immediate determinations at least 90% of the time. However, in about 3% of cases every year, the FBI is not able to resolve the background check within three business days. So that's the universe of cases we're talking about today. And importantly, this 3% of checks takes longer for a reason. In 2019, they were, uh, these background checks taking longer than three business days to complete were more than four times as likely to involve purchasers who were ultimately found to be legally prohibited from accessing guns. As you've heard, these cases disproportionately are disproportionately likely to involve purchasers with a significant history of domestic violence in particular, in part due to the complexities of conducting background checks in that area. Federal law and now Vermont law generally prohibits firearm access by some people who have committed certain violent crimes against a family or household member, but not people who have committed the same crimes or the same act against other victims outside the context of that family or domestic relationship. So if FBI records indicate that a prospective gun buyer was convicted of violently assaulting a victim, but the records don't specify the relationship the victim had to the perpetrator, the FBI will often have to conduct further investigative review. That takes human staff time. Um, they will often require contacting local, state, or tribal courts or agencies for arrests, conviction, protected in order, maybe hospitalization records, 
a process that simply depends in many cases on how quickly the other agency responds to the FBI with the needed information to determine the relationship the perpetrator and victim may have had to one another in order the, for the FBI to make a final determination about the legality of the sale. And again, to emphasize another statistic you've heard, as a result of these complexities, the US Government Accountability Office reported that from 2006 to 2015, nearly one third of all background check denials involving people convicted of misdemeanor domestic assault and other violent offenses took longer than three business days. In other words, and to put that a little more simply, when undergoing a firearm background check, people prohibited from buying guns because of their history of criminal domestic violence had nearly a one third chance of being able to illegally receive a firearm anyway because of the Charleston loopholes three day deadline. That's just not the right balance in my view for public safety. The FBI needs more time to complete these checks, not because of bureaucracy, but because accuracy matters. And getting the right answer can mean a world of difference for survivors of domestic abuse and violence and so many others. Uh, I grew up in Vermont, I'm speaking to you today from California, which is a, a state that opponents of, of this proposal, this legislation may point to as having the strictest gun laws in the nation. Um, in this state, gun buyers must wait at least 10 days in nearly all cases, a waiting period to receive a firearm. And state law enforcement who conducts firearm background checks in California have up to 30 days to complete a background check when necessary. Um, none of the opponents hyperbolic warnings have come to pass. Self-defense and gun culture is alive and well in California, as well as other states. 1.2 million guns were legally sold in the state of California last year alone. Many leading gun sellers, including Walmart, have made the responsible decision to only deliver firearms to a buyer once they receive a green light from the FBI affirmatively indicating that the buyer passed a complete background check. Responsible businesses like those face unfair competition from less scrupulous sellers who choose to profit and roll the dice and wash their hands of the consequences by delivering firearms to people they know may be prohibited from accessing guns by law. Vermont can fix that problem, better protect its residents from violence and self-harm. The U.S. House of Representatives has repeatedly passed legislation supported by Vermont's Congressman Welch to close the Charleston loophole at the federal level. And instead of waiting for the U.S. Senate to act, 18 other states have passed their own laws to close this loophole for their own residents for some or all firearm transactions, including rural and urban states, Republican and Democratic governors. I urge you to do the same for Vermont. Thank you for your work and time, and I'm happy to answer any questions about that provision um, or other uh, provisions of this bill and urge your support. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ken. Thank you. Has the state of Illinois, have they closed the Charleston loophole? Yes, they have. They provide uh, 30 days for, according to my notes, 30 days for these firearm background checks. Pretty sure. Um... Chicago's in that state. Um, is uh, what about uh, the state of California? Have they closed the loophole? They have. Um, they have a, a thirty-day limit for firearm background checks. Um, so this bill now, we're we're. I, I thought, Rich. Uh, this isn't a question for you. Thank you. Okay, and. Um, is your testimony posted? I'm not seeing it looking really quickly, but- um... yeah, But I'd be happy to share it. Okay, great. And um, can, so uh, yeah, I know you mentioned uh, California and Illinois, 30 days. Um, other states, um, what, what type of timeframes do they use? Of the 18 states I referenced that have closed this loophole for some or all transactions, a majority of those um, ha have, um, longer 30 days or longer for the background check period when needed to complete the background check there are um, a minority of those states have provided a shorter time period um, some states um, have simply said indefinitely until a person has affirmatively passed a background check that is when a person can, when a dealer can go ahead and deliver the firearm uh, but a, a majority of the states have, have um, matched what this bill proposes 30 days or longer a majority of the 18 states that have closed the loophole okay Thank you. Uh, Ken, do you have another question? No, sorry, okay. thank you. Okay, no worries. Okay, I'm not, not seeing any other questions. Thank you, thank you so much for your testimony. Take care. Yeah. Okay.
Okay. Um, we will hear from uh, Chris Bradley, and then we will um, break for lunch. And I'm hoping that the witnesses that we have not been able to get to this morning can be available this afternoon when um, when we return. So, Mr. Bradley, welcome. Thank you. Um, Chair Grad, I see that it is 11:39. Um, and I believe you want to break for lunch at 11.45. I am easily going to exceed 12 minutes. Would you like me to start and then stop? Or what's your pleasure? Um, I was going to go until noon. Does that work for you? Um, I will do my best, ma'am. Yeah. And then if not, if, um, if you aren't finished, are you able to come back um, after lunch? I am at your disposal. Okay. So then why don't we get, uh, get started um, so we can get you on, please. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Amber, could I share my screen, please? Yes, I'll, I'll make you co-host. Thank you. I hope that you can all see that. Yes? Yes, we can. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, my name is Chris Bradley. I am the president and executive director of the Vermont Federation of Sportsmen's Clubs. Um, I want to thank the committee for allowing us to give testimony on this. And just as far as some of my other credentials, I'm a former selectman of Northfield, former lister, former grand juror. I'm currently the secretary treasurer of the Vermont State Rifle and Pistol Association. And I also serve as uh, president and executive director of the uh, Federation of Sportsmen's Clubs. Um, just moving along here. Um, I'd just like to review on section one, which has to do with guns and hospitals. Uh, we have in Vermont uh, innumerable laws specific to guns. Um, this is a short list of them. Uh, I believe there are 12 that have to do with people acting out in some way with firearms. Um, and we are now considering uh, 4023, uh, possession of guns in hospitals. But you can certainly see, uh, I believe uh, uh, weapons in court were mentioned. We have aiming a gun at another, whether it's loaded or not. Uh, a number of existing laws having to do with firearms. Um, I, I'm gonna stop for a second and, and, and look at the genesis of S30 because this is a quote from the lead sponsor of S30 as to what and why he put the bill out. I'll read it as it stands now, if someone carries a gun into a hospital and someone sees the gun and asks them to leave, they have no recourse. A police officer can't get rid of that gun and the person can stand on their rights to have the gun in the environment. That was the premise for S30. The Federation responded to that by pointing at 13 VSA 3705, which is unlawful trespass. And we pointed out that we believed that 3705 handles the exact situation described by the lead sponsor. And it, that in fact, that statute is already in use, not only at hospitals, but also at other locations across the state of Vermont. As far as examples of signage, uh, here we see uh, the signs that when you enter Central Vermont Hospital, you go through multiple doors. This is one example of one of the sets of signs you have to go through. There are multiple sets of signs that you have to go through. So to say that we don't tell people that guns or weapons shouldn't be in hospitals is a bit of a misnomer. These signs, and I believe we heard testimony that these signs are at virtually all hospitals although they don't have security apparently. Uh, over here we see another example. This is not having to do with guns, but it speaks to the other, some of the other things that the trespass law can address. No shirts, no shoes, uh, no loitering. Well, loitering is a law, but uh, this is examples of where no trespassing laws can be enforced. Uh, just as an aside, uh, if you walk into the pavilion office building, we see this sign. And if we walk into the state house, we see this sign. Again, having to do with the genesis of S30, as originally written, it applied to not only hospitals, it applied to 
uh, state office buildings, as well as daycares. And I wish to point out that both state office buildings and daycares were stripped from this record, uh, from this statute proposed bill, when uh, individuals representing the state house, uh, buildings and grounds, um, as well as uh, uh, children and families, uh, said that they didn't need it. They are already covered. They have rules and regulations that made this not necessary. And in fact, in one case, it may even make their job a little bit difficult. So they uh, support uh, 13 BSA 3705, which is the underlying law which supports uh, daycares and state office buildings. I'd like to take a second just to describe what I believe is a flowchart, if you will, of how uh, S30 is going to work. So here we have a location posted for no firearms, the uh, hospital. Obviously, we're going to see somebody is seen with a firearm. So the, the first question comes in, do we have security at this location? Because if we have security at this location, the problem is addressed. Now that may be as a result of calling the police, but we have a method already in place if security is there. However, we just heard testimony that most of our hospitals, despite being, what, 73% of healthcare workers are subject to violence um, uh, and, and are therefore vulnerable. So what we have here is that a situation with no security, the police get called. So the police get called and I'd, I'd like to just take a just brief section. I believe somebody said that earlier that uh, 13 VSA 3705 requires that somebody confront the person. 3705 is very clear. It says that law enforcement acting as an agent of somebody can do that confrontation. Nobody at the hospital has to do that confrontation. All they have to do is pick up a phone, call the police, and the police will handle the confrontation. So we have police are called. Obviously, police are then going to arrive. And under 13 VSA 4023, we are now going to have a strict criminal liability which will then possibly lead to an arrest citation and at least a criminal record. So what we have here is once the police arrive, the problem gets resolved. And it gets resolved with strict liability and most likely a criminal record, if not an arrest. That's how I believe is it is, is there a discussion that this is not representative of how 4023 would work. I'll assume that, that we agree that this is somewhat accurate. Um, let's take a look at how 13 BSA 3705 works today. Well, interestingly enough, everything is the same up until the time the police arrive. All right, but now the police are here. Interestingly enough, once the police get there, they can hopefully peacefully resolve the situation. Um, sir, you know, there's a sign over there that says you can't have a gun here. Why are you carrying a gun in here? Could you take it out to your car? And if they refuse, at that point, law enforcement is perfectly within their right to arrest, put him in the back of the cruiser and say, and again, so we have an option here once police are there to, pull, uh, to resolve the issue peacefully. And if it's not resolvable peacefully, we're going to issue an arrest criminal citation and possibly even a, a, a record. So this is how 3705 works today. And we see the same problem, the same solution. Once police arrive, once they're there, we resolve the problem. So I'm just gonna come, so I, I'm gonna come back just in a second, but uh, to back to the lead sponsor of this bill. Quoting from testimony in a Senate judiciary, I think it is a fair enough set of questions you pose. If in fact, there are other laws that do what S30 purports to do, then I would say it is a strong argument for not passing it. It appears we have a law that does exactly what was wanted. I'm gonna just do a quick comparison of these two uh, laws. Here we see 3705 on the top. Here we see uh, S30 or the proposed 4023 on the bottom. 
again, we see the problem being resolved. The problem is that in one case, we have a police officer being able to use discretion. So to the point brought up earlier where someone inadvertently forgot that they had a, a pistol in their purse, the, the police officer can resolve that. No, no problem. Please just take the gun out. It's all set. Not a problem. With option two, we have strict liability. That woman has to be arrested. It, it, that's the way the law reads. So uh, again, we're resolving the problem once police arrive. And again, we do not need a hospital employee to make a confrontation. 3705 allows law enforcement to act as an agent in that regard. Moving forward, th there is one other flowchart, if you will, and that's the guy acts out, the person acts out. There was no police involvement. The police are going to get involved after the fact, once this bad person starts doing things. So I, I look at this and I go, you've put up a sign. Is, is a sign or even a misdemeanor going to stop someone with evil intent? We already have signs up that say these places aren't, shouldn't have weapons or firearms. Yet an evil person is not going to pay attention to that. Um, another concern we have is the definition of hospital as it shows up um, in this bill. Um, that refers to uh, 18 BSA uh, 1902. Um, this is pretty expansive. This is a huge list of facilities. And I believe Central Vermont Hospital actually, while it's the main hospital building, has something like over 30 satellite facilities. Do those satellite facilities also uh, constitute a quote unquote hospital? Um, we understand the intent. We want to keep people safe, but this is an extremely expansive definition. Um, and it is not just main hospital buildings. Um, again, referring back to the Senate Judiciary, uh, many people testified and uh, Defender General Matt Valerio had some specifically pointed testimony. Um, when he testified, he basically said that he uses four criteria for evaluating a bill. Are there any constitutional rights implicated? Are there current laws on the books that cover that activity? Will the bill achieve its intended purpose? Or will the bill make anything worse inadvertently for those intended to be corrected? Well, his answers, yes, there are constitutional rights. Yes, there are laws on the books that address this activity. Will it achieve its, assembly, uh, 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 its intended purpose? Quoting, probably not. Will the bill make anything worse inadvertently for those uh, intended to be corrected? Yes, they will. And he further indicated that this bill would prevent an employee in the hospital from being able to respond to a threat. And I, I, anyway, um, again, in Senate testimony, uh, Defendant uh, Valerio uh, shared that he served in the Governor's Violence Prevention Task Force. And he then made this statement. One of the things that became pretty well recognized when you are talking about actual safety was that more criminal laws and prohibitions on weapons were not going to be the way to increase public safety. This is our own Violence Prevention Task Force speaking and addressing Vermont issues. He also stated, and I, I find this, he also stated, I understand that there are times to pass bills that in and of themselves aren't going to have a major effect on anything. And this might be one of those times. Um, in looking at the uh, S30, um, and assuming that the uh, House Judiciary wishes to move forward with this bill, even though that it does appear to be completely redundant to 3705, except for the outcome, uh, the Federation respectfully requests uh, that Section A of 4023 be changed from a person shall not knowingly possess a firearm while within a hospital building to be a person shall not knowingly possess a firearm with intent to injure within a hospital building. 
suggested amendment. Intent with, with intent to injure does appear in state statute. Um, just, uh, I'm gonna switch gears now to talk to section two having to do with 13 BSA 4019. Do you have any questions for me on the hospital section? So um, I cannot, I cannot see all of my committee members. So uh, committee members, if anybody does have questions, and I'm not seeing your hand, please, uh, please go ahead. Um, no, no, thank you. And um, is this, this is posted, right? Your, your um, yes, this, this was sent uh, to Amber this okay. morning. Okay, great, thank uh, you. I, I will provide an updated version because there have been a couple of notes that I've made as, as I've been listening to other testimony. Okay. Thank you. I just want to make sure that your proposed um, language is, is in there. Thank you. Yes, I, it most assuredly is. Thank you, Chair. Um, just as a quick review, I'm switching now to the uh, um, background check uh, section 13 BSA 4019. Quick review, uh, only FFLs uh, are licensed to federally sell uh, firearms commercially. This is an extremely regulated prof uh, profession by federal law. Uh, just taking a look at the voluminous regulations that one must comport to is, is pretty daunting. Um, an F, FFL, as you know, is, is not obligated to sell to anybody. And in fact, an FFL is the last person on earth that wants to sell a gun to someone that's gonna do anything bad with it. In fact, most FFLs are exceptionally conscientious. They are looking and have screening questions that they ask people to try to weed out people that may be uh, at jeopardy. Um, and frankly, if the FFL doesn't like how somebody is acting or responds or, or answers questions, they don't have to sell. And there's no, uh, uh, there's no requirement to do that. Uh, as we know, when an FFL transfers a gun, a, a NICS background check is, is done. And uh, as, except for rare situations, backgrounds are virtually instantaneous. Uh, as an aside here, I've heard um, testimony this morning concerning the increase in the number of uh, of background checks that have been done, um, as well as the number of uh, default proceeds that may have occurred. Uh, this is in the face of every year uh, breaking records, every month breaking records as far as gun sales, uh, given the, the situation we're seeing in, in the United States and, and unrest in some cities. And just as an aside, uh, most of those new gun sales are to uh, women and people of color. Um, if a problem develops um, within the interpretation of uh, NICS information, it's usually due to trying to interpret state law. Um, what is a felony in one state may not be, it may be a misdemeanor in another. Um, and in fact, this, this has to do with, with how records are entered. So um, it, it is, it does uh, provide a, a uh, a daunting task to make sure that somebody who is not supposed to get a gun doesn't get a gun. Um, so moving forward, uh, under federal law, uh, if a definitive answer cannot be determined uh, within three business days, uh, this constitutes what is called a default proceed. Um, now, in, in considering a default proceed, um, I think it's important to understand that, again, most of these things are being done uh, almost instantaneously or, or certainly in vast majority within three days. Um, the fact of the matter, the default proceed was put into federal law to ensure that the ATF and FBI did their jobs in a timely fashion so that they were incentivized, they were pushed to get an accurate answer within three days. And just so we can, if I go to a gun shop on Thursday, file a, a 40, uh, 4473 asking to purchase a gun. Uh, they try to do a background check and there's something wrong with my, they don't get an immediate response. Um, Friday goes by, the weekend goes by, Monday goes by, Tuesday goes by. On Wednesday, I can then go back to that FFL and uh, pick up a gun under default proceed. Um, at least three people testified earlier this, uh, this morning that the Charleston loophole allowed a prohibited person to get a gun. That's not correct. 
The Charleston shooter, yes, received his firearm through a default proceeding. However, once the default, when all was said and done, it was determined he was not, repeat, not a prohibited person. Now, he still went out and acted up, but the fact of the matter is records did not support him not being able to receive a gun. So loophole, it's not. For 2018, um, and these are numbers that are somewhat dated because this actually hit me fairly quickly. Um, so I have not had time to research. Um, uh, and in fact, I believe uh, uh, Mr. Note um, uh, had uh, come up with some uh, uh, statistics on uh, back uh, default proceeds that I, I guess I, I didn't see in the records of the committee. I'd like to possibly peruse those. But anyway, for 2018, there are 26 million background checks. Uh, of those, uh, 4,240 went to prohibited persons through a default proceed. That does not mean that the ATF or the FBI does not continue researching. In fact, they continue researching for three months to make sure that they make an accurate determination. Looking at for 2019, there were 35,000 transfers in Vermont of which nine went to prohibited persons through a default proceed. In Senate testimony, we heard from Mr. Wallen, uh, who's the director of the Vermont Criminal Information Center. And he testified that seven of those nine had already been recovered. And the remaining two may have been recovered or were in the process of being recovered. And by the way, the ATF, not our local police department, does this recovery. So this is not impacting our local law enforcement. As far as amendments go, um, when problems are encountered with NICS data, those problems typically result with records not being properly en entered by individual states. Um, given that there were nine, I believe in 2019, I, I have to wonder whether those were Vermont-based records or records based from some other state that were in error or were not entered correctly. Um, as another aspect of this, in 2017, Congress passed the Fix NICS Act um, and it's been underway, um, I believe, since 2018 to specifically address instantaneous, uh, the increase in instantaneous responses, as well as to review all records to clean them up for anything that might not be clear for an ins instantaneous response. Bottom line is Nick's system, as has been previously testified to, um, is working as designed and it's being constantly improved. Um, I guess in one section uh, in F4 states that a person who, who uh, can receive, it, it, uh, who is an imminent risk, I guess it, it, it speaks to an allowance to have someone under imminent risk be able to purchase a firearm despite the 30-day law. How does a person convince an FFL that they are in danger and that FFL should ignore the 30-day requirement and not be in danger of a $500 or one-year fine, a $500 fine or one year in jail. As far as uh, uh, we certainly acknowledge the, uh, the need under 40, uh, 4057 that there are people with severe problems and that one very valuable source of information is healthcare providers. Uh, by the way, I'm now jumping to section three, I apologize. Um, in, in 18 VSA 9432, we see the definition of a healthcare provider, um, means a person, partnership, corporation, facility, institution, license, blah, 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 uh, to individual during that individual's medical care, treatment, or confinement. Earlier today, we heard from um, uh, Eric Fitzpatrick. He referred to 45 CFR. However, 45 CFR refers to something called a covered entity. In looking up the definition of a covered entity, we see that can be a healthcare plan, a healthcare clearinghouse, a healthcare provider who transmits any health information in electronic form. How does covered entity square with healthcare provider? Section three, still um, effect on people with problems. This is a major concern. Uh, I think we all want our people 
in jeopardy to be able to speak candidly with people that they trust and, and, and who will uh, help them. Um, will this have an effect on people speaking candidly to their healthcare provider if they know that there could be a negative outcome? Along those lines, veterans are, are particularly of concern to us. Uh, these are men and women who have endured things we can't even imagine, carry with them every day. Um, they need to be able to talk to somebody and they are going to be exceptionally leery of talking to somebody when they may have their rights at risk. Uh, I know this was addressed, but we still have some, some issues, some, some very serious concerns about uh, patient confidentiality and its potential conflict. Um, any, any questions on my testimony on that section? Because I'm about ready to jump to uh, a new section, the competition shooting. Um, I'm not uh, seeing any hands. I, I also do want to mention that um, Mr. Henry Parra will be, uh, will be with us this afternoon. And uh, I think it would be very helpful and, and supplement your, your testimony as well. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, just concerning the, and, and Chair Grad, uh, the Vermont State Rifle and Pistol and the Federation uh, um, are grateful for the consideration of this amendment. As we know in Vermont, uh, the second largest source of, of revenue to Vermont is sporting activities, uh, shooting and uh, of all flavors uh, um, impact that. Um, and these are both, uh, organized shooting competitions, NRA matches, CMP matches, but it's a, it's a wide variety um, uh, of events, everything from say an, an egg shoot at, at Barry uh, Fish and Game Club uh, to other organized sporting activities. Um, so I, I guess our thought, our request would be, thank you for picking this up and, and looking at this. Uh, we would ask, however, that organized shooting competition be considered to be changed to organized shooting activity or historical or educational events. And I'm happy to provide background on this specific to uh, the Vermont State Rifle and Pistol Association. Um, we shoot matches. Matches are always conducted on ranges. We, we're, they're conducted under very strict rules for how things can proceed. Uh, we have such things as designated range safety officers. We have a designated officer in charge. Um, range safety officer cannot do anything except watch everything that's going on to, for any possible problems. Um, we, and I, I guess the, I am not aware, although I'm sure they're out there, uh, of any situations where organized shooting activities were any problem whatsoever to, to Vermont. Um, in fact, it's uh, it's a draw. Uh, our the Vermont State Rifle and Pistol pulls in competitors, uh, which is why we were asking for this uh, from all over New England. When we run the uh, CMP New England games, we get people from all over the country, uh, hundreds of people showing up at Camp Ethan Allen in Jericho Bolton to compete against each other. Um, I believe that that uh, concludes my uh, testimony. I'll stop screen share at this point. Um, did I cover everything that, uh, I hope I did. Uh, excuse me, I'm not sure I talked to section four, um, having to do with uh, 4062, um, ERPO. I do see um, uh, uh, Representative Nath does have a question that um, is on what you did cover. Um, so if we could take that question and then, and then have you continue. Go ahead, uh, Will. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's actually more of a request than a question, which is going back to what you we just spoke on, the potential amendment on organized shooting events. Yes, sir. And, and you know, my concern with, it, it doesn't matter whether it's an organized shooting event or a music festival or anything. I mean, there's got to be some regulations so that it's not a, abused, so that, you know, someone who, who doesn't know uh, what they're doing, who is in over their head, doesn't have an event that 
that is out of control that where something goes wrong. So if we're going to move forward with this event, I would love to see, and I'll make this request for multiple people. I'd love to see some like guidelines that could be referenced as far as like what sort of re safety requirements, like you had mentioned, uh, you mentioned briefly, what sort of safety requirements would you think should be in place for a shooting event like this to be responsibly held so that we can be certain that, that if we have these, you know, they're only conducted by uh, responsible organizations, responsible parties. So I, I, I would love to, it doesn't obviously it doesn't even need to be now. I don't expect you to be able to, to just shoot this out off the top of your head uh, comprehensively, but I would love a, a list of well, like the sort of safeguards for these events that have previously been held that you think should be a requirement for people who might have them in the future? I guess if, if I could respond to that, Chair Grad, um, my suggestion, at least off the cuff, would be any organization that is recognized by the state of, state of Vermont. So uh, for one example, speaking to the Vermont State Rifle and Pistol, we're uh, an organized uh, group. We are registered with the Secretary of State. Um, in my capacity as uh, Federation President, I represent over 50 um, member clubs, most of which are fish and game clubs, most of which have ranges, and they're conducting anything from practices to uh, 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 events. Um, um, there are activities that are not necessarily competitions, but are still organized shooting events. Um, so I, I guess as long, would it be something to consider as long as, as it is being run by a recognized uh, organization uh, recognized by the state of Vermont? All right, thank you. That, that, that does make sense. Okay, great. So um, Chris, I would like to, um, to adjourn in, in five minutes. So either we can, we can come back lunch or um what's i don't i don't want to rush you but i also you did say that you're at our disposal so um i, I place myself at your disposal um and, and certainly concerning the, the the most recent amendment um i'm more than happy to provide any further information that the committee needs on on why this should really be supported okay okay appreciate it so how about if we come back at um, 1.30? I know the agenda does say 1.15, but I know people have, um, want them to get lunch and have other uh, meetings and things. So let's say 1.30 and we'll con continue, um, Chris, with you, with you if you do have more testimony and then um, go down our witness list. And like I said, we do have Mr. Um, Paro joining us. Um, I know that Chris, you had requested him and he's, he's visited with yeah. us before and is, uh, is very helpful. So I'm looking